Long time no see. Yeah, like five seconds ago. Um, I was out super late last night because Jay put on a Halloween concert at Ooh. 54 Below, yeah. and he was dressed up as Bette Midler's character from Hocus Pocus like no costume you've ever seen. It was, I was living my best dreams, my best little gay boy dreams. And this was your favorite movie from the time that you were, since it came out, right? Yeah, number one. 1993 was a really good year for movies. Was that also the year that Sister Act 2 came out? Sure thing. Um, it's, I learned in researching Jay and his new album, which is called Jay Armstrong Johnson, live at a Fine Science 54 Below, that his music inspiration was Whoopi Goldberg, not in Sister Act, but in Sister Act 2. Two. Better movie. Can you talk about how that happened? Yeah, you know, like when Whoopi, she's like talking to the like music class and she's like, eclectic, the word eclectic. I like rock and roll, rap, jazz, R&B. And uh, I just love that, that musical like thought, like, ooh, I want to like all forms of music. And so like that, I made it my mission in life to just like be so in tune with all kinds of forms of music. And that's actually helped me out in the, my musical career because there's all kinds of music on Broadway these days. And church music was a big part of that, yeah. too, right? Did you grow up singing in the church? I did. I grew up singing in the church choir. That was the first time I actually sang in front of, like, actual humans or, like, a congregation. Um, I and mean, then I, like, went into theater via church friends, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. It was Midsummer Night's Dream, the rock opera? <laughs> the rock musical, yeah. Midsummer Night's Dream, the rock musical. It's pretty good. Check it out. I also have it on good authority that you were in Romeo and Juliet in fifth grade. Yeah, Mr. Ingram's fifth grade English class. I played Romeo. It was much abridged, you know, fifth grade being fifth grade. I'm, I'm not surprised that you played Romeo. I petitioned for that role. <laughs> I literally wrote Mr. Ingram a letter. I was like, dear Mr. Ingram. <laughs> and that worked? It did. I think I was the only fifth grade boy that wanted to play Romeo in the play because you had to wear white tights. <laughs> and I, you were like, I'm home. I was into it. Yeah. yeah. And then you played Romeo again. Um, yeah. In a Jeff Buckley musical, yeah, right? The, it was called The Last Goodbye. It was out at the Old Globe a few years back with um, Jeff Buckley music. He's a singer-songwriter from the 90s. He's so good. I sang a couple of his songs last night in the concert, but it was uh, one of the best um, times of my performing career so far. Well, you have a long, like a lot of credits, including On the Town, Woo! which was one of the best revivals that I've ever seen. And you as Chip, just so fantastic. Thanks. I also think that your chemistry with Alicia Umfris, who's one of my favorite actresses, was uh, just off the charts. She's stunning. I yeah. wanted to just take you both home and install you in my living room so I could watch your scenes together <laughs> over and over again. Oh my God, I miss her so much, like every day. To, to go like spending two years with her, seeing her almost every single day, to seeing her like never is killing my soul. When you guys started working on this show, it was out of town, right? Mm -hmm. And there was, I remember hearing a story that you, uh, that there wasn't really any talk of it coming to Broadway, but you were like, this cast's amazing, maybe we can. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a summer stock production up in like Pittsfield, Massachusetts at the Barrington Stage Company. And um, my, I was in Hands on a Hard Body that only ran a couple of months, and I was so sad that my Broadway show was closing and I was gonna have to go um, uh, to do the summer stock gig, but I, I got the job and then I got there and it was Tony Yazbek and it was Elizabeth Stanley and it was Alicia Umfress and John Rando was directing and Josh Bergas from Smash was choreographing. And there was this, huge group of incredible artists and I was like this could go to Broadway and Alicia literally laughed in my face she was like <laughs> yeah right and then we went to Broadway yeah and the show's fantastic and I love Thanks. that the album is out and we can still live live it that way oh, I know. but let's just go back to hands on a hard body because okay. I don't even though it ran a couple of months I don't think we should just uh you know skim by it cool what a production mm. um I feel like it, that that role sort of spoke from your heart because of the Texas roots. Totally. Um, and you got a couple of really incredible numbers. It was the first role you originated. Yeah, it was my Broadway. very first actual role on Broadway. I'd been an understudy and a standby um, before then. But yeah, I mean, I'm from Texas. I got to walk on stage and just talk like this, like my dad. And that was pretty easy because it just comes to me naturally. You know, it was, <laughs> it was truly a really, really cool, very brief moment of time in, in my life.
I love the history of how you went from being a really high profile understudy and cover for Gavin Creel and Hair and for Aaron Tveit and Catch Me If You Can, um, which in a way you had sort of opposite experiences of right. going on for Gavin with zero rehearsals. Yeah. Can you talk about that first? Yeah, time? we were in previews and, you know, understudies in Broadway shows, um, they don't get to rehearse the show when you're in the rehearsal process and even in the preview process. So you're just watching rehearsals and you're watching. Um, previews and you're just taking notes um, and then once the show officially opens then understudies um, get to have their own rehearsal process but Gavin got sick third week of previews and uh, they were like you're on bro <laughs> and uh, so I just had to like hop to and um, we said I shove with love if I did if I just kind of looked like a deer in the headlights just like shove me in the right mm -hmm. direction but I don't really remember that first performance my very first like Broadway debut. Don't remember it. I got to see you in that role. Not the first performance, but you? later in the run. Yeah, I, d I did it like 25, 30 some odd times. Yeah. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was a really cool time. And then when you understudied Aaron Tveit and Catch Me If You Can, um, you had lots of rehearsal. And how many times did you go on? Not fucking once. <laughs> Zero times. Aaron Tveit, he's a workhorse. I mean, he's, he's... Darn that guy. He's a strong man. I did get to see you perform a song from that show in a 54 Below concert. Oh, yeah. Um, that was all... It was a cabaret of actors who never got to go on for the roles they understudied. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was so fantastic. He's was rich. Um, so, in addition to those high-profile understudy roles, you almost understudied Daniel Radcliffe. Yeah. Um, it was around the same time, um, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying and the Catch Me If You Can were auditioning at the same time, and I was in callbacks for both, and I got down to the wire for both, and I ended up getting both of them. Um, and then the Daniel Radcliffe understudy was an ensemble dancer who understudied, and it was a, um, a chorus contract. And the standby for Aaron is a principal contract, and so it was more money and like a better contract, so I ended up going with Catch Me If You Can. Um, and then it wound up that any time Daniel ever called out of his show, that they just canceled the show, because he's Harry freaking Potter. So I um, <laughs> made the right decision on that one. Yeah, good call. <laughs> I think a, another decision that you made around that time, or immediately following, that I admire so much, is that you said, I'm ready to be a leading man. I'm Understudying is maybe good money and maybe less toll on your body, but it's time for me to have my own roles. And rather than just stamping your foot, you went out of town, you played smaller shows, you went regional, and you proved to casting directors that you had it in you to be the guy instead of the guy filling in for the guy. Yeah, it was a, it was a tough time in my life. It was like about a year and a half or so of me living like in bum frack Queens for $500 in like a jail cell of a room with a, an hour and a half commute into the city to just pay rent and be able to eat. Um, but uh, it really, um, you know, it built a thick skin and uh, uh, here I am sitting with you at a old freaking L, so I'm feeling pretty <laughs> good about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm always so... Uh, in, impressed and uh, enamored of the stories of how much work it takes. And that's why I love talking about how you were doing theater and singing when you were in elementary school, because I think so many times people in the public eye are seen as being overnight successes. And that story bores me. I like to hear about the nitty gritty, like how how hard it was. Yeah, and, uh, Fort Worth, Texas is where I grew up and it's a randomly amazing cultural city. They have such great arts there and I had a really great supporters and really great teachers that like shoved me and told me that I had talent and told me that I should work at it. So, so I really, uh, uh, I feel blessed um, for all of that. Hashtag blessed. Hashtag blessed. One thing that, uh, that I learned from listening to the new album Jay Armstrong Johnson live at Feinstein's 54 Below, is how many friends you had from childhood who have gone on to do incredible things. It's weird. Yeah, like you brought some of them on stage with you uh, to guest on the show, which turned into the album. Totally. And how did that happen? Did, do, do people with talent just gravitate towards each other? I don't know. I mean, it was just, there's something in the water in like my generation down there in Texas. I mean, Todrick Hall and um, my friend Amanda Williams Ware is my backup singer and she's a stunning, stunning vocalist. And Allison Robinson, who's a good friend of mine, and she just released an, she's releasing an EP this week in Brooklyn. Uh, my friend Ahmad Simmons just, uh, he just opened Cats on Broadway 
Broadway, and he went to high school with me, and my friend Lily Froelich is also in Cats, and so it was just all of these friends of mine that are just like going on to do these incredible things, and I, 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 don't, I don't know how to explain it. I'm just happy that they're here, and I can play with them. Yeah, yeah. well, and thank you for letting us be a part of that. Hey, thank uh, you. Through the live shows and the concerts. Was Amanda the one that you had the Alanis Morissette curse with? Yeah. I love that story. Oh, that girl. Tell it's tell like, everybody about the Alanis God. curse. So uh, we were uh, we're driving to Amanda's um, like second year of college. Uh, she was going to Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri, and we were taking a road trip from Texas up to Missouri. And um, Amanda is uh, really great at multitasking while driving. So she's got like a cigarette in her left hand. She's got like a coffee in her right hand. She's like steering the wheel with like her knee and like reaching for the radio with her elbow. Yikes. And she like kind of starts going off into the median a bit, and she's about to like you know kill us and I was like Amanda look at the road and she freaks out and she overcompensates and we like spun five times in the middle of the highway and we like smashed head on into a guardrail that was only about like 30 yards long that was keeping us from going off into a ditch thanks god um and then we like were spun out into like facing oncoming traffic you left out the part about the fact that you were blasting Alanis Morissette's Jagged, Jagged Little, Little Pill, Pill album which is where this curse started so like on impact it's like the CD that we were listening to starts skipping. So it was like, oh, I'm it, oh, I'm it, oh, I'm it, oh, I'm it. It was like the most terrifying thing. Airbags have gone off. There's like smoke everywhere. I'm only laughing because you're sitting here and I saw her last night and I know yeah, you're both she's okay. She's fine. She played Mary Sanderson last night from Hocus Pocus. She's, she's well. She's very well. But, but that was a pretty scary time. And so we have this we had this curse on us, this Alanis Morissette curse that any time we heard Alanis on the radio, whether we were driving or whether we were in Gristides on 8th Avenue, something terrible would happen. Like, um, I got pulled over in Texas when Alanis came on the radio. We were like, turn it off! And then uh, in Gristides, it came on. We were like, get out! And I, like, I got a vocal hemorrhage that week. Like, it was it, something bad always, like, trails us when Alanis is around. And so... At the concert in April, we decided to sing an Alanis song to break the curse. And has it worked? It worked. We actually, <laughs> we walked into um, Key Foods across the street from my apartment up in Harlem, and Alanis turned on immediately when we walked in. We both freaked out. They were like, we're fine. We broke the curse. And nothing bad happened. <laughs> nothing bad happened. That's awesome. Yeah. I would like to talk about the chicken song. <laughs> this song is a... Internet YouTube sensation. It's a dream. Who who originated the song? Her name is Logan McWilliams. She's this brilliant singer songwriter that just posted a YouTube video of her song about fried chicken. And my friend Kevin Santos sent the video to me a few years back, and I've been obsessed with it. It's truly a remarkable like gospel song, and it's about fried chicken. And I had to cover it on my album and I asked Todrick Hall yeah. if he would join me to sing it and he did and it, I mean it's it's like a fan favor like everyone loves the chicken song Feinstein's 54 Below had a chicken special on the menu last night at the concert because it's such a big deal this is of all the songs on that album most of which are bona fide hits <laughs> that's my favorite one it's my favorite it's so good the song is so good Logan McWilliams you did it girl like that's a good ass song. So is Logan getting residuals from your album because I mean, you you guess I mean I'm sure that Broadway Records had to reach out to her via her YouTube channel and like buy it from her somehow. I want to meet her though. I want like me and Todrick and her to do like a like a YouTube like acoustic version of it like one day. I'm gonna put that, that out in the amazing. universe. Logan, can you hear me, Logan? Come to New York. Let's do it. We'll send her that. This video is going to video on demand as soon as we finish. Yeah, so we'll send yeah. her the link. Oh, that's so cool. Um, what's your favorite song on the album other than the fried chicken song? Mm -hmm. um, it, would, uh, it would probably have to be um, Thank You with, with my girl Amanda. Um, it's just uh, the sentiment of it. Um, it's, it's acoustic guitar, so it's one of the more stripped down numbers on the album. And it's just me and my best friend singing our tits off and like making we just like harmonize all over each other i'm like i'll take the low harmony you take the high harmony i'll take the high harmony that's something we just we, we were just doing what we did as kids as 12 year olds just on an album form so we were just you know literally living our dreams since we were 12. you also tell some really great stories and another role that you come back to that's been with you your whole life is peter pan hmm. you sing this incredible ryan scott oliver song yeah. from a new deconstructed peter pan story is a song called lost boy yeah 
Um, it's so beautiful. Ugh, he writes a good tune, man. Well, he was writing for your voice, from what I understand. Yeah, yeah. He calls me his muse, which makes me feel weird, but like that's very cool. If you guys don't know Ryan Scott Oliver, he's one of the best new musical composers around. So definitely look him up, and you'll find a lot of Jay yeah. and Lindsay Mendez and yeah. Alex Brightman, yeah. or his other muses. Yeah. Um, and I'm really glad that you put that on the record. Me too. Um, I'm he's such a, a big twisted fan. Twisted little genius, that Ryan. <laughs> I want to segue into talking about your on-camera career, Woo! which has come, really, you didn't do a lot of on-camera until really recently, right? Yeah. I mean, this past year, I've been, like, learning the ropes of what it means to be on a set and what it means to be in a frame and, like, not use your body when you're acting, because I'm, I'm a dancer, so I'm used to, like, using my physicality when I'm acting, and so now I'm working on what a close-up feels like and what a 16-hour day on set looks like when you're sitting on your ass for 75% of the day. You know, it's it's really been... Um, a learning, growing, and a really exciting experience. So you're appearing on Quantico right now. Quantico. And you, your character was gone for a little bit, but last night you made a return. Yeah, I made my return a couple of weeks ago, but I made a serious return yeah. last night when I was dressed in drag as Winifred Sanderson. I haven't even seen Not on episode. Quantico. We, we were both <laughs> at 54 Below last yeah, night. Yeah, while it was airing. For Halloween. So I haven't seen the new episode of Me Quantico either. yet. But I, I understand it. you had a hot makeout. There's a little bit of a sex scene with Russell Tovey. I'm not mad about it. My boyfriend's mad about it, <laughs> but I'm not mad about it. Do you think that'll be like an ongoing storyline? I'm not sure. I mean, this, I'm getting the new script for the next episode I'm shooting like today. So I, you read them as you shoot them. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy that I don't actually know the trajectory of my character until the very, very end. I, mean, I figured that you were... you. Like, the season was in the can already. No, nah, I mean, I, the writers have an idea of what they want the season to feel like, but they write it as we go. And so I'm just like, maybe they'll kill me off today. <laughs> maybe they won't. It's one of those shows that you're just, like, kind of like, uh, who knows? Yeah, it's one of those terrorism, entertainment, yeah. law enforcement, sort of soap opera-y. Yeah, sexy but, people with guns. Yeah, can't stop watching it. <laughs> yeah, I'm into it. I'm glad you're on it. Sunday nights at 10 o'clock. And I'm also really excited for you to take uh, take a leading role in this incredible web series called My Gay Roommate. I'm excited about it, too. It's going to be very fun. What's the timeline on that? Um, we are shooting the pilot um, in two weeks, I believe. So it's the cor over the course of three days. We're shooting the pilot. Um, I think there's... Um, the I'm blanking. Um, there's like a... A studio, I think, that's trying to get involved with it, and then we're going to shop it around to networks or something to see what could happen. I don't know. I'm excited. I, it'll be my first, like, leading situation on camera. So it, it'll be new and exciting. I'm nervous. I'm sweating right now. <laughs> so is this... So the web series, it started as these three minute long clips that were just done for fun, right? Yeah, my buddy Noam Ash, like back in college, wrote this web series and it got, it garnered such a huge following, like 5.6 million followers and views on YouTube. And so, I mean, uh, he's revamping it and raised 60 grand on, I think, Kickstarter and they're gonna, we're gonna do it up. And is it gonna be 30 minutes, like, a, or 22 so. minutes, I, like, yeah. like TV length? I think so, as yeah. As opposed to... And then we're like, Netflix. Like, and you Netflix. played the straight roommate. Is the that... straight one, what a twist. What a twist, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. Which actually reminds me of a funny story. When I first saw you on stage, I was like, who is that, and is he available? <laughs> and then I was introduced to you, and you went... I was like, hey, girl. Yeah, you were like, <laughs> hey, diva. <laughs> diva. That's, that's <laughs> and I went... Weird. Okay, we'll be friends. <laughs> but I believe it. I believe I'm. I'm looking forward to seeing Thanks. you. Jin Damiano is playing my love interest, which is very exciting. Oh, She's yeah. So very talented and not too hard to look at. That's right. Yeah. Is your boyfriend going to be mad about that one too? Um, he'll get over it. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, can I just see your fingernails for a sec? Can you hold them up? Shit. This was part of his costume uh, from last night. These nails were, these fake nails were, how, they were like two or three inches long. It's like Winifred Sanderson nails, like the pointy long nails. Um, and I, they're glued on so hard and I tried to pop them off, but I was gonna like rip off my entire nail. 
I couldn't even wipe my butt last night. It was terrible. <laughs> it, was, it was literally the worst. Like, I don't know how you females do this. Like, I really don't. Like, I can't take down my underwear. I can't zip up things. Like, I truly can't function with nails. So I just had to clip them off. But I guess I'll have them for until they fall off. You have to go onto Jay's social media and see some pictures of this costume last night. I really think Bette Midler would be proud of how just completely you dedicated yourself to not just that, that costume and the character, but your entire show was Hocus Pocus themed. Thanks. I mean, I have to give so much credit to the designers on the show. D.W. Withrow designed the costumes and Katie Beatty designed the wigs and Nicolette Gold did my makeup. Um, and so I, I really had a team of brilliant, brilliant artists that really helped me pull off this incredible night that was somewhere out of my dreams. Well, there are, there's already video on, on YouTube, and Jay tweeted it. Uh, his Twitter handle is super annoying because it has, really? like, all these underscores in it. Sorry. But it's J sorry. underscore A underscore Johnson. I'm sorry. So follow him on Twitter. <laughs> um, and I want, we're going to go to questions from the audience, but Ooh. I think we should tease the fact that in early 2017, something exciting is happening yeah. that we can't talk about Ugh, yet. I'm sorry. That's pretty annoying. But, but it was really exciting. It's, it's really exciting, and you'll be posting information about it as it becomes available yeah. on Twitter at J underscore A underscore Johnson. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But it'll be here in New York. It's a dream role of mine, and I'm excited um, when they announce it, finally. Uh, let's go to the audience for some questions. Never be sorry for that Twitter handle, Jay. <laughs> thanks, um, thanks. So the nail story is crazy, but in the spirit of the day, uh, what are a couple of other favorite costumes that you've worn on Halloween, and maybe do you have a couple of other fun Halloween stories in the course of your lifetime? Um, I was Freddie Mercury a couple of years ago, which I really liked. I like painted an entire bodysuit, like the Harlequin, like diamonds and stuff. Had a great hair, it, and it, it actually sang a concert with Ryan Scott Oliver. It was like the the Dead Celebrities Ball. It was like back in two thousand, eh, whatever. Um, <laughs> but um, Winifred Sanderson is actually like my like peak in terms of costumes. Is what I've always wanted to do, and now my next thing I want to do is the mask. I want to like really pull off like Jim Carrey's The Mask. So I'm gonna try to maybe do that next year. I'm going to um, put it on my calendar the night before Halloween <laughs> to be at 54 Below. <laughs> Another question? Hello. Hi. I wanted to know, do you remember the first Broadway or off-Broadway play that you've seen that um, really inspired you? Yeah, I was 15 years old. My friend Jason Radigan and his family took me to New York for the very first time. We stayed at the Waldorf Astoria, how luxurious. Um, and I s sat in the second row orchestra of um, Thoroughly Modern Millie, and it changed my fracking life. Um, it's when I fell in love with Gavin Creel and then ended up understudying him 10 years or like six years later. I mean, Sutton Foster is a gem of a human, and it was just, it was a magical, magical experience and solidified my love of Broadway. Did, do you find that um, having been a fan like that and caring so much about a show helps you with your interactions with people who come to the stage door to see you? Oh, totally. It absolutely does. I mean, uh, I, I, I was that guy. I was that stage door kid. I was that fan. I was, I was that guy. And so um, I understand. It's love. It's art. It's like it really inspires people, and it makes people think about the world differently, and it makes people think about their life differently. And I, I think what we do um, can be fun and kooky and ridiculous but it can also be uh, life-changing um, and uh, truly uh, empowering sometimes. Who are you obsessed with right now? Like, who are you fanboying over? I'm kind of fanboying over uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, I didn't actually get to see him in Sunday in the Park because I was too busy prepping for my concert. But um, my buddy Max Chernin was in it, and I read the New York Times review, and I've heard him sing before. And I, I, I'm fanboying over the fact that an A-list movie star is coming to Broadway and mixing himself with the Broadway culture and um, really like digging his toes in there. And so uh, I'm excited to see what else he does in terms of theatrical. Jake Gyllenhaal can sing. He can sing, dude. He can yeah. sing. You, to play George in Sunday in the Park with George. Did you see it? I saw it. Shut up. <laughs> That's amazing. It, yeah, it was incredible. Oh. Uh, and I hope and I kind of just know in my heart of hearts that he's going to be coming to Broadway and like winning all the Tonys. I know. So I'm gonna that was a good, good answer to oh, that question. I know. I love him. <laughs> Do we have another question from the audience? Hey, what's going on, bro? Hey. Um, so what's your favorite uh, moment from On the Town? 
On the Town. My favorite moment from On the Town is probably the Tony Awards. We didn't win shit that night, but <laughs> <laughs> but we had so I had so much fun. I mean, it, it was Tonys are crazy. You wake up at like 4 a.m. and you're exhausted, and you have to go to those rehearsals in the morning, and then you get on a bus and go back to your theater, and then you get in your clothes again, you go back to the theater. So it's it's a day of work, but it is truly some of the most exhilarating times you can ever have. I mean, sitting in front of the television as a young little gay boy and dreaming of it, and then having being able to live it is just like uh, it's out of this world um so the tonys were really some some good times and that the tony party well i don't really remember it <laughs> <laughs> as they say right. if you really remember it you weren't really there right. jay thank you for being here congratulations thank on you. everything thank you so follow much. jay on twitter at j underscore a underscore johnson i'm sorry buy his new record which is j armstrong johnson live at feinstein's 54 below <laughs> thanks you guys <laughs>